Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, I'm Brett Quick. I'm the co-head of Government Affairs at the Financial Services Forum. Um, I am excited to bring you our final panel of the day covering a topic that um, feels like it's been top of mind for Washington policymakers for quite a while, but has certainly received um, heightened interest in recent months with uh, a number of market events and um, some you know, economic conditions that have been changing more broadly. Um, so today we will discuss the state of the digital assets industry, um, the regulatory outlook, and how the banking sector will adopt these new technologies, as well as um, some barriers that exist um, from a regulatory perspective for regulated entities. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just quickly introduce um, our panelists here. We're pleased to be joined by uh, Commissioner Hester Peirce of the Securities and Exchange Commission, where she has been since 2018. Um, Commissioner Peirce has an extensive career in uh, securities law and examining financial markets. Um, and she's been really an outspoken proponent of thoughtful and responsible regulation in the crypto space um, that doesn't stifle innovation. Um, we're also joined by Andres Wilberg Stark, Stock Global Head of Strategy and Regulatory Advocacy for City's Chief Technology Officer. Um, in his role, Andres leverages his experience on the front lines of digital innovation to map the bank's path on emerging technologies and to interface with regulators and policymakers around the world. Um, and finally, last but not least, we have uh, David Portia of Cravath, Swain, and more. Um, where he leads a financial regulatory practice and advises clients on prudential regulatory matters as well as how the banking sector handles crypto asset exposures. Um, and through his work, David plays an important role in the conversation considering the, the future of banking and the future of finance. Um, so we're looking forward to hearing from each of our panelists. We have a lot of ground to cover in this space, so we'll go ahead and um, dive right in. So I want to start with um, really sort of the market volatility that we've all seen. There have been you know, countless headlines over the last few months um, regarding the volatility and in many cases, really steep declines in, in asset prices. I think when I checked this morning, um, the price of Bitcoin was hovering around 22,000, uh, which of course is a, a really significant decline from its peak, I think last November of around 67,000. Um, so the declining prices of course have been coupled with news of significant layoffs, of collapsing projects, and of course, you know, investor losses. But all of this is really against the backdrop of um, some tough economic conditions more broadly. You know, of course, we have 40-year uh, high inflation, as we all know. I think the S&P, uh, while we've seen a little uptick today, coming off of some relatively positive earnings, um, is still you know down 20% from its high in January. So, um, Commissioner Purse, I want to start with you. How does um, all of the volatility that we've seen in the the investor losses and the declines in prices, how does that sort of impact the momentum for developing a regulatory framework uh, for crypto in the United States? And how does the DC ecosystem kind of react to investor losses and failure of some of these firms? Well, as an initial matter, I have to say that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Um, you know, the volatility is something that I think it's, in a way, it's, it's good for people to be reminded that these are volatile assets and you have to be careful. So I think that piece of it um, from a regulator standpoint, you know, then we're able to point and say prices don't always go up. So you, you should be careful. Um, I think some people are, are clapping their hands and saying this is the end of crypto and they're excited about that. I think other people are realizing that moments like this um, help to wash out um, some of the projects that weren't going to succeed and the people who are working on building things just sort of hunker down and, and they build things that, uh, you know, it can be a, a good moment for them to do that. Uh, at the same time, I think it, it does make regulators sit up and pay more attention to crypto because there are retail folks who did lose money um, and we see some of the very common problems that occur in, in the financial industry and the, the traditional financial industry playing out in crypto. When you've got centralized entities, you've got to look at who their counterparties are. Are they doing things 
with retail investors' money that um, you know is is riskier than what they were saying when they took that money. Um, you you start asking those kinds of questions, and I think again that's healthy, right? It's leverage is it can be an issue in in this world as it is in the traditional financial world. So it's a good moment for people to recognize that those lessons do pour over from the traditional financial world. And then for regulators, I think. Part of my frustration is I think some of this could have been avoided if we had actually put a regulatory framework in place that made sense earlier. I think we would have avoided some of the problems we've seen. Um, but it is a moment for us then to, to, to say, okay, maybe we should take this seriously and maybe we should take this time um, to put in a regulatory framework. And I think you're seeing attention paid on Capitol Hill um, maybe around a discrete area like stable coins, you could get something done relatively quickly. We're seeing more comprehensive bills laid out as well. I think those are likely to take a longer time, but I think it's um, moments like this and events like this do help focus the mind. Of course, the SEC might run to its comfortable place and just bring enforcement actions, which is what we've tended to do so far. <laughs> Um, moving to you, David, you know, and Commissioner Peirce touched on this a little bit, but you know, we keep hearing this term crypto winter and this idea that, that the crypto space is really just experiencing this sort of difficult period and they're going to come out um, on the other side. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, is, is what we're seeing part of just a broader economic slump or is there something really specific that's going on with crypto that's causing them to really have an outsized um, sort of decline in this environment? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I don't, you know, I, I probably won't try to speculate on the cause of the decline of the price of Bitcoin or other crypto assets, but, you know, I do think maybe I'll just pick up on a little bit about what you said, which is, I think when you see, you know, the price declines are headline grabbing uh, for sure, and the retail customer losses that you read stories about are headline grabbing for sure, um, and I think. It can cause the you know DC ecosystem of focusing on what's achievable quickly, um, because you know nothing better than an easy victory or a quick victory. <laughs> and I happen to think that you could see, like on the legislative front, um, you know perhaps that leads people to focus on areas where there might be the ability to find agreement in a shorter period of time, uh, you know, the more near term. I think stable coins is probably the obvious area for that. Now you could ask yourself whether stable coins have anything to do with the crypto asset price volatility we've seen. And the answer very well may be not, nothing whatsoever. But that doesn't mean that the um, reaction to the price volatility might not cause those who are trying to get something done to identify areas where there's an achievable, um, uh, where there's an ability to build consensus. Um, so, you know, I think if you were to ask me what comes out of the crypto winter, I think it's it's partly that we may actually end up with some policy making in areas that are adjacent to, but not necessarily, you know, addressing the cause of the crypto winter. There's also a long history, of course, in financial regulation policy of having policy making that is adjacent to and not reflective of causes of crises that are being addressed. So it wouldn't be an anomaly necessarily for that to happen. Yeah, great. But we also we see a lot of that reactive sort of policy making, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, Andres, turning to you, something you and I have discussed um, is the comparison to the, the dot-com bubble and this idea that, um, you know, comparing sort of to the, the the number of firms that failed during that time when there were so many sort of coming in as new entrants to the market um, and the idea that crypto is sort of experiencing that now and that, you know, ultimately it may be as simple as um, the strong ones will prevail and the weak ones will be sort of filtered out through through some of this cycling. What's your view on that? Can you expand a little bit and provide thoughts there? Mm. I, th I think there are similarities and differences with the, the dot-com crash. Um, one similarity seems to be that there's been a lot of just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. And really not everything has stuck. Um, it's actually 10 weeks exactly today since the implosion of uh, Terra. Um, 10 event-filled weeks. The, <laughs> one of the uh, differences, I think, is in the way all of this activity was funded, which 
in this, uh, in this case was, I think, a lot more often by end users or consumers and ICOs provide a lot of the, the funding of a lot of this activity. The downside of that being that a lot more consumers ended up getting hurt in the regulatory vacuum, perhaps, than VCs back in the, the dot-com crash. Um, potential similarity would be that lots of people who were out there on the front lines actually getting their hands dirty with the mechanics of creating these things might be usefully reabsorbed into the uh, sort of more mainstream uh, industries, as happened in, in you know, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. One big question, and I think it's one that we'll all be watching for a while, is will there be a similar effect um, as in the dot-com crash, where industries overall move in and start leveraging these technologies, but also you see the emergence of a couple of really, really big players uh, who would have become the big techs that we know today, uh, is there going to be an equivalent of that in, in this phase? So watch and see. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, the role of traditional finance in the crypto space and some of the you know, risks and benefits um, associated with regulated entities being a part of these markets and having exposure to digital assets. So, Andres, I'm going to stick with you for a minute. Um, would love to get your thoughts um, and your role, you know, how traditional financial firms are really approaching um, the desire to be in some of these markets, um, given the regulatory challenges and the lack of clarity that exists in terms of what they're really able to do, um, and how they're sort of responding to client demand to the extent that client demand is, is high. Um, and then finally, this is going to be kind of a three-part question. You know, to the extent there are some, what are, what are steps that the regulators could take now that would sort of provide some of that clarity and allow um, banks in particular to have a more active role in these markets? Yeah, great question, questions. <laughs> um, first of all, the, the answer to how banks are responding to client interest, I think would be very carefully and uh, very deliberately because of the, the clear risks involved. Uh, one way to think about it is cross-section of planet Earth from the green life-sustaining layers uh, outside and then getting closer to uh, more challenging molten cores. Um, the, the, the green life-friendly layers could be banks leveraging uh, DLT approaches for their own purposes internally or with each other in permissioned environments. Um, and then obviously a little bit closer in, offering traditional vanilla banking services to companies that happen to be engaged in uh, DLT crypto work. Maybe one layer further in, getting warmer, um, is offering synthetic exposure to price action from crypto assets, then offering custody of actual crypto assets, um, operating crypto assets for the public, and then probably the, the molten core for now, meaning not going there uh, at all, is um, actually trading uh, on, on their own books. So if you, if you take that sort of approach, the answer to your other question, which is what can regulators do? First of all, I think it, it's important to acknowledge that the absence of regulatory clarity so far achieved one goal, which is not stifling innovation uh, and allowing time for some of the, the caveats that may have seemed very hypothetical earlier on to become very tangible. Unfortunately, of course, people got hurt. Um, but I think that period of regulatory light touch, the time for that is probably over now for just from a perspective of, of consumer protection. It is also true that it's very difficult for banks to take even early steps until there's a clear definition of where the uh, 
edge of the regulatory cliff lies. Because absent that, you're in a sort of fog and you can't be sure that your next step isn't going to be the one that tips you over. Um, so regulatory clarity, which doesn't necessarily mean, back to your point about uh, a stable coin uh, uh, regime, it doesn't necessarily mean, or maybe it shouldn't necessarily mean, creating a whole new stack of regulation side by side with what we already have which is a little bit the European approach with MICA, um, the risk of creating a whole new regulatory stack being that there is very quickly going to be stuff that kind of falls in between or where, where you're not sure which of the, the regimes applies. And just from that perspective, given the regulatory fragmentation for which we're already well known, it might be uh, cleaner to not be too technology specific and to just extend organically existing regimes as required, if that's possible. Uh, the Basel Committee recently released a second consultation on a, a, a framework for prudential treatment for crypto exposures that banks are holding um, on their balance sheets. There was a lot of concern about the first iteration of this last September and the really you know sort of punitive treatment that seemed to be applied to banks that wanted to hold these um, assets on their balance sheet and the risk weight that was applied in the proposal. Um, so, David, I, I want to turn to you. The, this new draft, is it uh, a significant improvement? What does this sort of mean going forward? Um, how are banks kind of reacting to, to the second run at that? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So, and maybe to answer that question, I'll pick up a, l a little bit on the comments that were just made, which is, you know, where could there be clarity for banks to operate? I think you touched on them, but I think there's three areas where it's there's really achievable uh, for the it would be achievable for the banking regulators to provide clarity on how banks could interact with crypto assets, and that would be custody services, customer facilitation, different types of trading to help customers and risk management hedging for customers. But then related to that is the capital treatment of the exposures for which you're you know, providing those facilitation services. And that's where the Basel Committee framework comes in. So the Basel Committee last June put out a proposal that was uh, calibrated in a very conservative way. And I think the point of view of the banking industry was that it would essentially preclude banks from having exposures to crypto assets. And what does it mean to have exposures to crypto assets? It means you know, writing a derivative to your client to hedge their exposure. It probably doesn't mean at scale for the foreseeable future holding Bitcoin on your balance sheet. You know, I think if you talk to folks in the banking industry, that's not an area where they're really focused on moving. I think there's a lot of focus on being able to provide risk management products to others who might have spot exposure to crypto assets. And so the industry said as much to the Basel Committee, look, this is gonna preclude us from acting because the capital charges are calibrated so highly, effectively a dollar for dollar deduction. It's not exactly how it was done, but that was the effect. Um, and you know, to the credit of the global regulatory community, uh, they took the comments on board and issued a revised proposal a few weeks ago. And I think the answer is it's an improvement. <laughs> But there's probably still, you know, work to be done to get to a point where um, it would be feasible for banks to engage in these activities and provide customers core banking services, risk management services. And so I think, you know, at, at some level, I, I believe the global regulatory community who's working on this needs to step back and ask themselves what their goal is. Certainly, one goal is a conservative calibration for an asset class for which there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of volatility, and that's completely appropriate, and I personally would agree with that. But there also needs to be a little, I believe, a little bit of a results-oriented goal, which is, well, it can't be so conservatively calibrated that no one can actually engage in this activity. And I think, you know, it's only been a few weeks, and I think everyone's digesting the proposal, but the broad takeaway is we're, we're probably a little bit closer to, you know, over conservatism that needs to be calibrated a little bit more finely. Um, so, you know, that's kind of my question on the Basel Committee proposal. I think it was encouraging that 
the Basel committee took all the comments on board, revised the approach, reflected the comments of the industry and others. Um, but I think it's an ongoing dialogue. And I think getting that right is actually a really important gating item to moving on to you know, permissibility on customer facilitation, for example, because it's kind of hard to engage in customer facilitation or facilitating risk management activities at scale if you don't know what the capital treatment's gonna be. And so I think it's a really important step. And the Basel Committee has suggested that they're trying to wrap up by the end of the year, which I think, you know, all else equal would be a good thing. Commissioner Purse, from your view as a regulator, what do you see as sort of the primary benefits as well as the risks of having you know, regulated entities play a more significant role in this sort of new and burgeoning space. Um, and then uh, sort of as we've discussed the, the volatility in the space, do you feel like that's discouraging regulators from wanting to give regulated entities a path into the market for fear of exposure to, to some of the volatility? Well, on the last question, I think, you know, regulators do have to think about that. What are the, transmi the, the possibilities of transmission of disruption from the crypto world into the traditional financial world if we do allow for greater linkages um, to, to doing that. But from my perspective, the benefits are, I think it goes to a point Andres was making, which is that we sort of are thinking of these things very separately now, crypto and traditional finance. But over time, I suspect those two will intertwine more. Um, and I think people are looking for use cases for um, distributed ledger technology in the traditional financial world. And so you might end up with a situation where you see a very traditional front end, but in the back there's, there's less traditional technology operating. And, and so you, I think we need to allow that to happen. And I, I am worried that the lack of regulatory clarity has actually resulted in less innovation in that space than there otherwise might have been because people have been um, worried that they don't want to get anywhere near close to, to, to these ambiguous borders that the, you know, that the regulators have set up. But I think also just from a customer perspective, I mean, allowing an example that I think is, is pretty well known now is, is the SEC is not, has not allowed a, 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 Bitcoin, a spot Bitcoin exchange traded product um, to trade on the markets. And to me, that looks like a very merit regulatory decision. Um, we don't have the ability to be a merit regulator, but I think we are in this area doing that. And so what you end up with is you have people who are, who are getting exposure to Bitcoin in ways that are less, less good for them for what they're trying to achieve. They, they want to have it alongside the rest of their financial assets accessible in the same way. They want to be able to talk to their financial advisors about what percentage of their, of, of their portfolio should be exposed to, to this, um, if any. And so I think by not allowing those conversations to happen, there are ways to get exposure to Bitcoin through traditional financial products, but there, a lot of people would argue less appropriate um, to get that exposure, less direct ways to get that exposure. So who are we helping here? I think we're, we're, not, um, we're, we're not really helping the, the investor and we're making it really awkward for these financial firms that are getting asked by their clients all the time about it. There's, there's not a good avenue for them to send these folks in. Um, so I think those are some of the things I think about when, when I think about trying to, trying to you know, integrate these things more into the traditional financial system. And, and, you know, the same with ICOs. If we could come up with a good disclosure framework around token offerings, we would have been in a lot better place had we done that already. Um, but I think if we were to do that, then you might see people, and if we were to think about what does it mean if a token is a security or if token offering is a securities offering more precisely, what does that mean for the way a token can move around the system? And maybe we, we end up in a place where people are, say, well, let's just, let's just design tokens that are, that are equity. Um, why, not, why not just tokenize existing securities? You'd, you'd allow for that kind of experimentation to happen. So practically speaking, um, there are proven to be quite a few challenges with really establishing a regulatory framework for crypto 
broadly, but there seems to be near universal agreement that regulation is needed for the sustainability of the industry and to protect investors and consumers. Um, but how to achieve that has, has not been uh, a simple task, particularly when you have a number of, of jurisdictional debates. Um, but the administration took an important step in March of this year when it issued an executive order um, instructing several agencies led by the Treasury Department uh, to really assess and develop policy recommendations um, related to crypto. And last week, Treasury asked for, for public comment on their report. So, David, starting with you, what is your assessment of this effort and how it's going so far? Are you optimistic um, that this report and this work stream will produce really sort of meaningful and significant recommendations that will sort of move the ball forward um, in terms of legislative action where it's necessary and, and appropriate regulatory action? Yeah, I am. I think there's a lot of potential for that um, in the following sense. So I think the uh, you know two important reports are due out in September: the CBDC Future of Money report and then the broader crypto asset report. And you know, I guess a, a part of the you know premise to answering your question, Brad, I think is well, what what could the Treasury's work product really, you know, what would be a home run from the Treasury's perspective, from a policy-making perspective? And I guess, you know, on that score, I would um, mention, as many folks know, the Treasury has a long history of issuing reports or white papers to try to spur policy debates. I think in March 2008, the Paulson Treasury issued their blueprint for financial reform. In June 2009, the um, Geithner Treasury issued their uh, white paper that you know was the precursor to the Dodd Frank Act. Of course, in the Trump administration, the Treasury issued a bunch of reports on a number of topics, and in none of those cases did every single aspect of those reports you know end up a part of regulation or law. Um, but they really do have an agenda setting. Uh, ability. And I think the PWG's report on stable coins is a perfect example. I mean, my own view of that uh, brief history is that before the PWG report on stable coins came out, no one was talking about stable coin legislation in any meaningful way. All of a sudden, the PWG report comes out and says every stable coin issuer should be an IDI. And we have like a pretty robust debate about what the legislation for stable coins should be like. And is the legislation, if it ever occurs, going to mandate that every stablecoin issuer be an insured depository institution? I'll go out on a limb and say, not a chance. But I think the Treasury achieved its objective of really moving that debate. And I think that would be the measuring stick that I would use for um, you know, what we can expect out of those reports in September, the Future of Money report and the broader crypto report. And so I think, I think the Treasury will do a great service if they go out on the limb and make policy recommendations like they did in the PWG report, right? That was a pretty bold recommendation. Yeah, at the one hand, you could say it was sort of an anodyne recommendation because they're saying, well, banks should just do it. On the other hand, it was bold in the sense that they're saying, like, we're going to take a very like, robust view of how this activity should be regulated. So I think if they can go out and you know, put that into the public dialogue, I think that will be a, a good service and I think it'll move the debate forward. David, follow up for you. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion amongst the, the banking sector about the recent staff accounting bulletin uh, that the SEC issued impacting, you know, the custody of, of crypto. How do you think about that sort of effort and how it complements or conflicts with the broader effort coming out of the executive order and, and what Treasury is working on? Yeah, it's a great question. So this is staff accounting bulletin number 121, which if I'd summarize briefly, you know, says that an, an, an SEC registrant, which uh, safeguards crypto assets on behalf of customers, has to do two things. One is to recognize a liability and corresponding asset on its balance sheet in respect of those safeguarded crypto assets. And two is offer pretty robust disclosure about the risks attendant to those safeguarding activities. Um, so for, um, you know, this is the financial services forums policy settlement or an organization about banks. For banks, to say the obvious, this can have pretty significant knock-on uh, consequences because if you're putting assets and liabilities on a balance sheet, uh, that presumably means that you have to hold capital in respect of those newfound assets, which can be, you know, economically pretty challenging. Um, so, you know, how does it relate to the Treasury's work on the executive order and the broader debate? To me, it's 
emblematic in the sense that they're very there very well may be sound reasons for um, the policy that the staff was trying to achieve through SAB 121, but we probably didn't need to find out about the knock-on consequences for banks kind of ex post after this policy is announced and now try to figure out how we deal with it. Personal opinion, banks are probably going to be pretty good custodians of crypto assets. Like banks have been custodians for a very long time. They tend to do it in a safe and sound manner. They tend to be, there tend to be minimal losses associated with banks acting as custodians. So like, why are we precluding them from acting as custodians, which, you know, net net, if you were to ask me, I'd say it's probably not good for consumers. And so now we're in this sort of like, you know, unpeel the onion type exercise. And I think just having some leadership around questions like those so that um, you can hopefully end up with a rational policy response from the get-go. I think that's kind of like, again, that would be a home run if Treasury can use their bully pulpit in the financial regulatory community and try to bring some leadership around these issues where maybe a, a view across agencies and across different regulatory interests would be helpful. Commissioner Purse, do you have anything to add to David's comments on SAB 121? How were you thinking I about that? He was being very uh, diplomatic there by not calling out the SEC directly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was very unhappy with the process around how that SAB came out. Um, and I think that it, it's a bit illustrative of our approach to crypto in general. It's, I feel like sometimes we throw stuff out there with an idea that it can be used as a, as a lever to get something else to happen and we might not think about the collateral consequences. Um, so I thought it was a very strange staff accounting bulletin issued in a very strange, uh, at a very strange time in a very strange manner. Um, but I, I think it's just part and parcel of our larger problem with, with crypto policy at the SEC, which is we're not, we're not willing to you know, say here's the objective we're trying to achieve, and as you said, there 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 are good objectives to it, right? You you do want retail customers to be thinking about who's holding their crypto and what are the consequences if something terrible happens to that entity. That's that is important for people to be thinking about. But I think we need to have that conversation and say, look, this is this is the the thing that we have in our mind. We want to make sure the disclosures are clear. Um, what are the consequences of going down this particular route? Or maybe it's not even our job to do it in this space. Maybe it's something that was better left with FASB to, to do. I'm not, I'm not convinced. Um, I've had issues with staff accounting bulletins in the past when I think they've been you know, driving policy decisions that maybe should come from another entity or maybe from the commission level. Um, so those, those are some general thoughts. I do welcome people to come talk to me about SAB 121. I'm trying to figure out if there's anything that I can do in that space to be helpful. Please. Half a second to build on that. Um, it is an interesting scenario when we think about retail investors. Uh, there's another layer potentially when we think about asset managers and people who operate ETFs and things. If they are responding to consumer demand for instruments that involve crypto, are we pushing them to do custody with less regulated, less transparent actors if they cannot turn to banks to operate their custody? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a good point as well. Andres, I wanted to follow up with you on how, from your role within an institution, how you're monitoring some of these efforts coming out of Washington. And David mentioned the, the president's working groups report on stablecoin. And I think that the general sentiment um, from that report was that it was largely favorable to regulated entities and to banks. So how are you thinking about the, the much broader effort and expectations of, of what's going to come from um, what Treasury is working on and everything out of the executive order? Do you expect that um, some, some clarity will be provided that, that sort of um, clears the way a bit for uh, institutions like Citi? Or um, do, you, do you sort of expect more uncertainty going forward? Well, there's, there's expectation, definitely. There's maybe an element of trepidation as well, because um, I don't think anyone is looking forward to the task of 
reconciling the output of all those reports and synthesizing and figuring out what they mean in the aggregate. I'm not quite clear on whether there's a plan uh, for that to be done at the government level after all the reports are out. Um, it would be somewhat surprising if there weren't apparent discrepancies or maybe even open contradictions between uh, or among across some of those reports, unless there's an incredible amount of coordination being done behind the scenes before the reports are published. Um, and therefore, the extent to which that very large number of reports on their own are going to be able to add um, clarity and uh, remove uncertainty is uh, to be seen. Well, we're coming up on time, and I want to leave a few minutes for questions from the audience, should there be any. So, Commissioner Purse, I want to close with you. I know that you and, and CFTC Commissioner Caroline Pham have publicly called for uh, the CFTC and the SEC to jointly hold public roundtables to discuss how you can sort of responsibly and thoughtfully um, approach regulation in the crypto space. Can you tell us a little bit about how that effort is going? What should we expect to see from that? And you know, what would you hope to get out of of those roundtables when they occur? Well, when they occur, you're being very optimistic there. <laughs> I mean, you know, so far we haven't seen that happen. I, I, I think it's bad when we're in a situation where you've got different regulatory agencies jockeying for position and, and it sort of seems to be a self-aggrandizing or jurisdiction-aggrandizing effort instead of trying to figure out, okay, where does regulation appropriately lie? And I think that has, it, it, it's it's soured the, the the view of a lot of people of regulators in Washington to see this. Now, of course, a lot of people are pushing for CFTC to get more authority because they don't like the approach the SEC has taken so far. And I can't, you know, I, I can't really fault them for that because we haven't taken advantage of tools we have to actually um, to actually provide exemptive relief. But I think Commissioner Pham and I are still committed to trying to figure out a way to do this. Um, it, it's obviously easier if it comes from the two chairs of the agency of the agencies. But I would I would love it if we could do it with our two agencies or even broaden it to include banking regulators. Um, I think it would be just a good a good message um, to people that we are all thinking through these issues together. Um, but it, it does require a push, I think, from from the heads of both agencies to really move forward quickly on that. Well, we look forward to seeing that. Um, at this point, we can open it up to questions from the audience, if there are any. We have a quiet group today. Ah, here we go. Question. Um, back to SAP 121. Commissioner um, first. Oops, next. Okay. Uh, Given uh, your unhappy, speaking of SAB 121, given your unhappiness with the process or lack of process uh, in, in its um, publication and following on David's comments, uh, what, in your opinion, would be the best outcome for it? Well, I mean, I think that's a good question. I think in part it depends on what the discrete issues are that people bring to me. And, you know, the one is, is the question of whether we're pushing uh, banks out of this, as both of you raised that, are we pushing banks out of the custody business altogether, and is that really what we want to do? Um, I, I would like to see us take a pause, say we're, we're pulling back the SAB, let's get everyone commenting on the record so that people can respond to each other and see what it is we're trying to achieve, and then if we need to do that by do something by a rulemaking or if we need to maybe provide a directive to FASB to think about this issue, I guess that would probably be my preferred approach. But again, I'm open to hearing from people um, what they think the right approach is. The, the odd thing about this, we do staff accounting bulletins. This is 121, so we do them periodically. Um, and sometimes they're more substantive than others. And sometimes it's a staff accounting bulletin, so it doesn't have the force of a rule. But this one was odd in the sense that it had an implementation date um, and it, it led to immediate reaction from people that suggested it's more rule-like. So I think when we're doing something rule-like, we really need to have a, some sort of notice and comment process around it. 
Another question from the audience? All right, seeing none. Well, that concludes our digital assets panel. Thank you so much to the panelists. Um, I want to say on behalf of the Financial Services Forum, thank you all very much for your participation today um, at the forum's first annual summit. Um, and I want to announce just a, a couple of housekeeping items very quickly. Um, video from the event will be available later this week on the forum's Vimeo account, and we'll make sure to notify everyone when it's up, um, as well as photos um, on the forum's Flickr account. Um, and I want to thank everyone who made this event possible. Special thanks to Aiken Gump um, for use of their space. And most importantly, I um, want to share with everyone that lunch is available right outside, so please feel free to grab it um, and dine wherever uh, looks cozy. So thanks again, everyone. If you have any uh, questions, comments, or feedback, please certainly reach out. Thank you.